Mr. Sunil Kita, the President and CEO of Nihon Keizai Shimbun, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to wish the Nikkei Conference a very happy 20th birthday. The Nikkei started this conference in 1995 with Mr. Lee Kuan Yew and other Asian leaders. It has grown into a valuable platform to discuss developments in Asia. By promoting mutual understanding, the conference also contributes to growth and prosperity in the region. So congratulations. This year's theme is Rising Asia, messages for the next 20 years. Everyone knows the remarkable progress of Asia over the last 20 years. Since the end of the Cold War, Asia's strategic weight in international affairs has grown. It's home to more than half the world's population, and its share of global GDP has risen from one-fifth to one-third. Asia is exerting greater soft power, too, whether it's through Uniqlo fashion, Bollywood movies, or K-pop. Where will Asia be 20 years from now? We can predict some trends with confidence, but there are many unknowns and therefore many possible outcomes. This morning, I'll talk about both the clear trends and also the critical uncertainties in Asia over the next 20 years. The key players will still be the same, China, US, and Japan. India may play a significant role too, but its focus will be South Asia rather than East Asia. So what key questions will determine how things turn out in these countries? That will give us the basis to discuss how the regional landscape as a whole will look like 20 years from now, in 2034. And I hope you will find this approach useful in understanding the dynamics of a rising Asia. Let me begin with the US. Today, it's the dominant global power. In the Asia-Pacific, US power and influence have underpinned regional security and stability since the Second World War and enabled all countries to prosper. The US has been a benign and constructive power, which explains why it is still welcomed by countries in the region. The Obama administration's rebalancing towards Asia reflects this American strategic view that the US has been and always will be a Pacific power. But unfortunately, the strains of being the global policeman have taken their toll on the US. The wars in Iraq and Afghanistan have cost the US more than 50,000 soldiers killed or wounded. The American people are naturally war-weary. They are reluctant to engage in new fights or take on fresh burdens. Whether in Syria, whether in Ukraine, or in Asia. Its adversaries sense this and harbor hopes that the US has lost the will to advance its interests and to defend its red lines. The US economy, too, has gone through a rough patch. The global financial crisis was a major setback. The crisis has passed, but conditions have still not recovered to their pre-crisis levels. Politically, there are deep divisions in the US between the Democrats and the Republicans that have undermined America's ability to tackle the financial crisis, as well as other important issues, ranging from reforming immigration laws to overhauling social spending. Because of these difficulties, some people say that the US is in permanent decline. I do not believe this. The US is a very resilient, dynamic, and entrepreneurial society. It has been through many trials and tribulations in its history, and each time it has bounced back. I believe that in 20 years' time, the US will remain the world's preeminent superpower. China's GDP will probably exceed Americans in absolute terms, but not in per capita terms. 
The U.S. will still be the world's most advanced economy, leading the world in innovation, in technology, and in talent. I expect the Fortune 500 global list 20 years from now to include many new American companies which do not yet exist today, just as neither Google nor Facebook existed 20 years ago. Shale gas will enhance the competitiveness of U.S. industries and could also be an additional tool of U.S. diplomacy. The U.S. armed forces will still be the most formidable and technologically advanced in the world. Whatever its preoccupations elsewhere in the globe, the U.S. will continue to have a huge stake in Asia. The U.S. will still have in Asia important interests, large investments, major markets, and many friends here. And it will have every incentive to engage Asia across a broad front. But there are two key uncertainties in this prediction. Firstly, how soon can Americans get over the current mood of angst and withdrawal and regain the confidence and the will to advance American interests around the world? And the second is whether the U.S. can get their politics to work. Politicians on both sides need to come together to overcome the present gridlock and forge a consensus on the way forward, rather than be mired in partisanship and fundamental disagreement. I do not know when the U.S. public mood or political impasse will change, but I'm confident that these are not questions of whether, but when. Besides the U.S., China will also play a vital role in the region. In fact, the biggest change in Asia in the next 20 years will be the growth of China's power and influence. Regional countries are still adjusting to this because this process has already begun. The World Bank forecasts that China will be the world's largest economy in PPP terms by the end of this year. In 20 years, it will have grown three or four times larger. Its standard of living will have reached what the Chinese call a modestly prosperous society, Xiao Kang Shehui. Second-tier Chinese cities like Chongqing or Guangzhou will join Shanghai and Beijing among the world's leading metropolitan areas. Many more Chinese companies will be global leaders like ICBC, Haya, and Alibaba. The People's Liberation Army will be a much more advanced and powerful fighting force, commensurate with China's economy and power. The PLA is developing and acquiring advanced military hardware and capabilities like stealth jets, aircraft carriers, and cyber warfare. It will still not be anywhere near the US military in sophistication or reach, but it will be a force to be taken very seriously. China's military modernization should not surprise anyone because national defense has always been one of the four modernizations in China, along with agriculture, with industry, and science and technology. But China also has a serious demographic challenge. Because of the one-child policy, China will be one of the most rapidly aging countries in the world. Already, the size of the Chinese working population has peaked and is shrinking. In 20 years' time, China will have nearly 300 million seniors aged 65 and beyond, which is almost the size of the whole U.S. population today. So China is likely to grow old before it gets rich. I see two key uncertainties in China's future growth. One is internal, one is external. Internally, can China transform its society to meet the new social needs and expectations of the new generation and transform its politics to produce a stable, forward-looking government that acts in China's long-term enlightened interests? China's economic transformation is bringing profound social changes. The new generation is urbanized, educated, internet-savvy, and vocal. Hundreds of millions are well-traveled, 
middle-income professionals. China needs to build social institutions and safety nets to take care of them. It will also need to adapt its political system to work in this new society and overcome serious existing problems like corruption. These would be major challenges for any country, much less one the size of China. China has no roadmap to follow as it tries to develop workable social and political models, unlike when it comes to economic strategy. Because for economic strategy, you can follow theories of economic development. There's the World Bank to advise you. But there's no precedent in any country for the transformation which China will go through. The Chinese will have to feel their way forward carefully, like crossing a river one stone at a time. That's the internal challenge. Externally, the question is, how will this major growth in China's influence and power affect its relations with other countries, big and small? How will US-China relations develop? Can China and its much smaller neighbors manage their relations constructively so that friendship and cooperation will prosper while its neighbors retain their independence and their strategic space? Will China be welcomed and respected as a large but benign power, shouldering its share of international responsibilities, the way many Asian countries have accepted the US since World War II? Or will China be viewed with wariness and apprehension? For three decades, China has prospered by following three dictums laid down by Deng Xiaoping in the 1980s. One, stability overrides everything. Wen ding, ya dao yi qie. Two, let some people prosper first. Rang yi bu fen ren, xian fu qi lai. And thirdly, keep a low profile internationally. Tao guang yang hui. On these basis, China has maintained stability domestically, transformed its economy, and integrated smoothly into the global community. How is, going, is China going to re reinterpret or modify Deng Xiaoping's dictums for the 21st century? The challenges facing President Xi Jinping's administration are daunting, but that is no reason to conclude that China will fail. Its leaders are competent and pragmatic, and they fully appreciate the magnitude of their task, unlike in the former Soviet Union. They are serious in tackling their problems, whether it's restructuring the SOEs, despite displacing millions of workers, or curbing corruption, even at the highest levels. They know that China's internal challenges remain their top priority. And there's tremendous drive among the Chinese people and officials at all levels to learn and to do better. Now let me turn to Japan. Japan has endured a very difficult two decades since the bubble economy ended. With his three arrows, President Abe, uh, Prime Minister Abe, has boosted confidence and launched difficult reforms to revive the economy. I'm confident that in 20 years' time, Japan will remain a major power. It will still be one of the world's largest economies with great strengths in science and in technology. It will continue to contribute to regional peace and stability within the framework of the US-Japan Security Alliance. But like China, Japan faces a very difficult demographic challenge. Your population is aging and shrinking rapidly. In less than two decades, Japan's population will have shrunk by almost 10 million people, which is the equivalent of two Singapores. Some forecast that as many, almost as many Japanese, there will be almost as many Japanese centenarians as there will be newborns, babies less than one year, one year old. There are two possible impacts Japan can mitigate. The, there are two possible ways Japan can mitigate the impact of this demographic problem. One is immigration, which seems politically impossible. 
So the other one is to revive the economy through structural reforms which will improve productivity and encourage more women to work. Prime Minister Abe's third arrow is aimed at the right target. But structural reforms will take a long time to show results, often several election terms. And the key question is, will Mr Abe and his successors be able to muster the political consensus to support reforms over many years through the pain and the displacement which they will cause in order to eventually reap the dividends. The success of Japan's reforms also depend on Japan's external environment. If Japan enjoys good relations with your neighbours, economic cooperation will thrive and this will give the reforms the most favourable climate within which to succeed and show results. But if Japan has problems with its neighbours, the regional frictions will sap confidence and it will discourage trade and investments. In 20 years, it will be a century after the Sino-Japanese War and the Pacific War. So another key question for Japan is whether Japan and your neighbours, especially China and Korea, can come to terms with this history and work together on win-win cooperation for the future. Of course, it's not just a question for Japan, but also depends on the attitudes and the actions of your neighbours. For reconciliation and cooperation cannot be achieved by one party alone. These trends in US, in China and in Japan will interact with one another to produce the new strategic landscape in Asia. What can this new landscape look like? One scenario is that Asia remains at peace with countries working together to advance their shared interests while competing peacefully with one another. The US maintains its rebalance towards Asia through successive administrations and engages the region across a broad front, not just in security matters, but also trade, investments, education, and people-to-people -people exchanges too. In this good scenario, a more powerful China establishes itself as a status quo power which adheres to international law and norms. It maintains constructive relations with other powers while giving smaller countries the space to thrive. The US and China find a new modus vivendi, competing for influence, but with a sufficiently strong overall strategic relationship to accommodate each other on many issues. Japan revitalizes its economy and recovers its confidence. It works with its neighbours to put the history of the war definitively behind it and establishes trust so that all sides can move forward on a win-win basis. And that will depend in particular on the US-Japan Security Alliance because America's active involvement will exert a moderating influence on all sides. A stable strategic environment will foster regional economic integration. We are not likely to see any breakthroughs at the WTO, but the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the TPP, and the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, the RCEP, should have developed and perhaps will have linked up to bring us closer towards the goal of a free trade area of the Asia-Pacific. Greater economic interdependence will raise standards of living for all and contribute to a peaceful region in a virtuous circle. In this good scenario, ASEAN members are able to deepen their cooperation and integration with one another. A cohesive ASEAN continues to play a central role in the regional architecture, and ASEAN is an effective neutral platform for major powers to engage one another. ASEAN will remain an attractive investment destination and an attractive trade partner, holding its own against other regional economies. So this is the good scenario, and we hope it happens. But if things do not work out right, we will be contemplating another, less benign scenario. The tremendous growth in China's size and power can prove too much for the regional order to accommodate. 
U.S.-China relations become fraught with tensions, pushed by a zero-sum view of the world and through the lack of mutual trust. China's influence, instead of being welcomed, is merely tolerated by other smaller countries in the region. Territorial and maritime disputes in the East and South China Seas continue to fester, overshadowing efforts to build goodwill and win-win cooperation between China and its neighbors. There are tensions in Asia between other countries too, arising from unresolved historical issues, territorial disputes, and nationalist populism. Nationalism is a growing force in many Asian countries. Indeed, it is today, as we have recently witnessed in the anti-China protests in Vietnam. In some countries, politicians try to win votes by hitting back against exploitative, allegedly exploitative foreign investors, by playing up historical grievances against neighbors, or by stirring up animosity against foreigners. In Japan and Korea, the history of the war continues to drive public sentiments towards each other. And in China, pride in the country's astonishing progress has roused strong nationalistic feelings and a desire to claim China's rightful place in the sun after more than a century of humiliation. Such a strategic climate inevitably sets back economic cooperation there are more in trade disputes, even currency wars, tit-for-tat protectionism. And the result is less shared interest in one another's success, more frictions and disputes, and fewer restraints when things go wrong. With the big powers at odds, ASEAN countries are forced to choose sides, and Southeast Asia again becomes a proxy battleground, as it was in the 60s and 70s, during the Cold War. Everyone loses in such a scenario. Both the good scenario and the bad outcome are imaginable. Which comes to pass depends on two key factors. The first is US-China relations, and this is the most important bilateral relationship in the world for the US, for China, but for all other countries also. As President Obama and President Xi Jinping acknowledged recently, both countries have many shared interests despite their frictions and disputes. China relies on US markets and know-how, while US companies see China as a key export market and manufacturing base. Both recognize the need to work together on global issues, whether it's managing the situation on the, on the Korean Peninsula or tackling climate change. Nevertheless, China's rise will be an enormous challenge to US-China relations. History has shown that the rise of new powers often leads to conflict with the incumbent power. On both sides, both in China and in America, there are those who doubt and distrust the other's intentions. And it will require great restraint and wisdom to overcome this distrust and reach a workable and peaceful accommodation. So one key factor in determining the next 20 years is US-China relations. But another key factor influencing Asia's path is how nationalism develops. Will it be a source of national pride and confidence, promoting peaceful and beneficial cooperation between countries, similar to the cooperation between companies like Sony, Samsung, or Lenovo? Or will it become a virulent nationalism, fueling defensiveness and insecurity, causing enmity and tensions, and passing on the burden of history from one generation to the next? So those are the possible scenarios. Those are the key questions. But everything I've said so far makes one big assumption. And that is that there will be no war in the next 20 years because otherwise all bets are off. And no country wants war, and every country will try to avoid it. But that does not make war in Asia impossible. There will be tensions and frictions, and incidents can escalate, and miscalculations can lead to unintended consequences. One possible flashpoint 
is the territorial and maritime disputes in Asia over the Senkaku or Tiaoyu Islands and in the South China Sea. These disputes have heated up in the past two years with incidents at sea, battles using water cannons, and even collisions between ships. These are deeply worrying developments. Already, the tensions have soured bilateral ties between the contending states and affected tranquility and confidence in the whole region. But if in one of the incidents, a sh ship is sunk at sea, or people are killed, or there's a collision between aircraft, the situation can easily spiral out of control. In 2001, there was an EP3 incident between China and the United States, and that was a close call. So that is one hot spot. Another hot spot is the Korean Peninsula. No one can say what will happen in Korea over the next 20 years, in North and South Korea over the next 20 years. Quite possibly, the status quo will prevail with repeated brinksmanship and occasional tensions, but no war. But worse outcomes are easily imaginable. A, reg a regime may suddenly collapse like East Germany did in 1989. Alternatively, brinksmanship and miscalculation could escalate into an armed conflict. But even in the absence of war, failure to denuclearize the Korean Peninsula poses a continuing risk. Because North Korea will continue to develop its nuclear capabilities. And at some point, this will cause other countries in the region, including Japan, to seriously reconsider their nuclear stance, in fact, their non-nuclear stance. And if another country decides to go nuclear, it would destabilize the entire region with unpredictable and dangerous consequences. I have described these scenarios and uncertainties vividly to help us visualize how things can turn out. I'm not predicting what will happen, but I'm describing what may happen. Over the past 20 years, Asia has done well, despite the Asian financial crisis in 1997, the SARS outbreak in 2003, and the global financial crisis in 2008. Each time, we emerged stronger. For Asia, the next 20 years will be an historic opportunity. The risks are not insignificant and the journey will not be easy. But on balance, I believe that we will achieve a large part of the good outcome and avoid most of the bad scenario. This is because I'm confident that the US will not relinquish its decades-long position as an Asia-Pacific power. And I'm hopeful that as China's power grows, it will find ways to continue integrating smoothly into the international system. But whatever the forces driving the politics and policies of each country, ultimately we share a common interest in peace and prosperity in Asia. All stakeholders, big and small, have a responsibility to make this vision come true. So let us all work together to seize the opportunities ahead and create a brighter future for ourselves and our children. Thank you very much.